today. How you doing? Let's get on our feet today. How many of y'all are ready to worship the King? Let me see them hands. Let me see. raise them hands. Raise your hands. There's no greater place to be than the house of the Lord today on a Sunday, right? All right, before we get started with worship, let's just start with the prayer. Let's just bow our head, close our eyes, lift up our hands, and just begin to thank Him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done, Lord. Thank you that we've come this far in Jesus, that you have not abandoned us, Jesus. We thank you that you're holy, Jesus, that you're merciful, that you forgive us, Jesus. We thank you that you're with us every step of the way, that you don't abandon us, Jesus. We thank you that you're a provider, Lord. We thank you that we're covered with your blood, Jesus, that we have your angels encamped around us and defend us, Jesus, and that we're covered, covered with the wall of fire, Jesus. Thank you so much, Lord. We pray today that the service is just in your hand, Jesus. We pray that your will be done today, Holy Spirit. You have all the liberty here, Jesus. Break any chains, any strongholds, anything that's just been holding us down today, Lord. We just surrender it to you, Jesus, today. All this, everything, Lord, the worship, everything is for you, Jesus. Just We pray that it's pleasing to you, that it's a pleasant offering to you, Jesus. We pray that your just will be done, Jesus. We pray that all of this is to honor and glorify you, Jesus, and that we can worship you today, Jesus, without any fear, without any limits or strength, Jesus. Lord, open up our eyes and ears today just to receive this message, Jesus, and that we leave here transformed and not the same, Lord. All this is for your honor and your glory, and we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, you are ready to worship the King. Let us see the hands. Hey, we can't just go, hey. Nothing's exciting just like Jesus, amen.
It's a beautiful name, amen. There's no other name like it. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. Everything changes when the name of Jesus is said. Something has to change. Great are you, Lord. You are the
that he saved you from that will change your praise to the king oh we give you glory god because it's your breath in my lungs you breathe life into my lungs so i think i can speak i can breathe i can sing and glorify your name so can you lift up your praise published church can you tell him he's great can you tell him he's powerful can you tell him he's almighty oh we praise you god because it's your breath in our lungs jesus it was your blood shed on the cross so that I can have freedom, that I could be free, that I could be healed. We thank you, Jesus, so we sing. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour, so we, oh, we pour. It's your breath. Can you lift up your voice, church? Come on. In our so we pour. Oh, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you. Oh, lift up your praise to the King, church. Lift up your praise. We pour out our praise to you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Jesus, the name of Yeshua, it's a beautiful name, amen. No other name like the name of Yeshua. You are the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high.
we grow numb to that. But there's power in the name of Jesus. There still is power in the name of Jesus. Our God has no rival. He is fighting for us. Death could not hold him. The gates of Haiti could not prevail, amen? Oh, and the death, that was like the most important thing. It could not hold him. That was the greatest thing the enemy could offer. No, it could not hold our God. That's our God. above all names it is still the name in which we find salvation it's still the name that makes demons tremble and flee and it is still the name that brings healing over your body healing over your mind healing over your spirit and over your soul it is the mighty name of Jesus and you know it is in Jesus name that we pray and Jesus says whatever you ask the Father in my name right? my respects to the Virgin Mary right my respects to Peter and Paul but Jesus says, whatever you ask the Father in my name shall be done. It's a powerful name, the name of Jesus. <laughs> Let's pray so we can get into today's teaching. Father God, we praise you and we glorify you. And we thank you for that name that is above all names, the name of Jesus. And it is through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we approach your throne in this moment, asking that you would prepare us to receive from your word. We ask that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to believe and have faith. Give us grace and favor before each other, and above that, give us grace and favor before you. And Father, if there's a spirit of disturbance that tries to come to steal the seed, which is your word, from falling on fertile ground, which is our hearts, I thank you that in the mighty name of Jesus, you have given us power and authority. And in that name, to all spirits of disturbance, Together with no fear, Pueblo's church says, the Lord Jesus rebuke you 
and we bind them and send them to those places that are lonesome and void that you have prepared. And Father, I pray on behalf of myself, I'm just your servant. As that you would give me the words and the wisdom I need to bring a message that will be a blessing to us all. And as I've asked you many times in the past, give me grace and favor before your people, but above that, give me grace and favor before you. I ask for a fresh unction. Fill us all with your Holy Spirit and help us to learn to depend more and more on your power. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord some praise this afternoon. <laughs> Pueblos Church, you may be seated. And I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. We're going to cover a lot of ground today. And um, so I'm, I'm, going to, I'm not going to go as fast. And all the other services, I was motor mouth. Because in Spanish, it's like a lot more words. And then we have like another service after each service. So I'm, I'm not going to be so uh, um, motor mouth with you guys. I'm going to slow down a little bit because also my, my throat is going a little hoarse. But um, we're going to cover a lot of ground. And um, today you're going to get a 3 four, one All right, a 3 four, one You're going to get three messages in one. Okay. I'm going to talk about three big topics, and, and it's, it's going to be a, a three for one. And um, two weeks ago, I, I taught on finances. I talked about money. It, the, the title was Not My Money, But God's. And we talked about how everything we own belongs to God, and we're just administrators. Last week, we had a little pause. And uh, actually, last week, uh, Hebert, Daniel, uh, shared a word, and he, he shared about giving. Today, I'm going to talk about three, three things. I'm going to talk about tithing. I'm going to talk about investing, saving and investing. And then I'm going to talk about um, uh, spending or living within our means. And so I'm going to break it up in three sections. Um, this is going to be the first section. Those of you that like to take pictures. Oh, man, that's, that's pretty cool. Did we do that last service? Did you have that last service? Oh, okay. Anyways, if you want to take a picture, take a picture in this way. And that way, later on, you can go back and, and look at these verses. Before I get into my teaching I want to remind you what I taught two weeks ago, that when it comes about, when it comes to money, when it comes to tithing, this is a spiritual matter, all right? This is a spiritual matter. And this is the reason that people in church get bothered when we talk about money. People outside of church get bothered when we talk about money. Um, and, and, and they're critical about the church when the church talks about money. They don't talk about lives being changed. They don't talk about marriages being restored. They don't talk about families being reunited. They don't talk about the impact in the community. They don't talk about the youth that are, that are, that are staying out of trouble. No, no, all they talk about is money and they're critical critical of the church about money, and we have to ask ourselves, who puts that thought in them? Who puts that feeling in them? Is it God or is it the devil, right? Is it God or is it the devil? And, and, and you, can res you, can, you can answer that question on your own. I'm going to share with you, um, first of all, I'm, I'm going to teach about tithing, but before I get into my, this, I want to tell you that the most important thing, and I'm going to share with you today something, that, how, how many people do I have here in your 20s or younger? Is there anyone here that's in your 20s or younger? Raise your hand like that. Man, that's a lot my wife wanted to raise her hand. <laughs> happy birthday, my love. My, my wife's birthday was um, on the 13th, and so happy birthday. And um, thank you, guys. <laughs> also, happy, happy belated birthday is what I should say. Happy belated birthday to my sister-in-law, Ronnie. The, the, her and my wife share the same birthday. And um, last service, people got scared. Last service, people thought it was the, the last day. They heard trumpets, and they thought that it was the trumpet of the Lord, but it was mariachis that came in. I had mariachis for my wife in last service. And, um, but you should have seen people's faces were like, <laughs> it was amazing. Anyways, happy birthday, Ronnie. Happy birthday, my love. Um, but um, I don't even know why, how I got off uh, on, on y'all's birthdays, but either way. Um, my wife and I, my family that's here, we, we all practice tithing. But I, I want to share this before I get into this. I was asking who's in their 20s. That's why, because my wife raised her hands. Who's in their 20s or younger? Renee, calmate. Okay, who's in your 20s? Let's do it again. One more time. Sorry. Who's in your 20s or younger? Raise your hand. Don't be afraid. Raise your hand. Okay. I'm going to share something with you that if you will do what I'm going to share with you, all right, your life projection, all right, you, you will change the course of your family, right? Those of you that are parents, if you will teach your kids what I'm going to share with you, grandparents, if you will teach, I've taught this to my, to my, to my nephews. Um, I'm sure my nieces have heard me talk about this in, in occasion. I, pretty much my family practices what I'm going to share with you today. Um, but but I'm gonna, I'm, I would, this will change the course of your family if, if you will put into practice what I'm going to share. But before I, I talk about that, and at the end I'm going to tie it all together, but before I even get to that, I do want to say this. 
No matter what we talk about money, we talk about blessings and prosperity, and I believe in all of that. The most important thing is that you would have salvation through Jesus Christ, right? The most important thing is that you would confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you would put your faith in his death and resurrection, right? That's the most important thing. And if you seek that, God's blessings will automatically be over your hands, over your life. Will bless, he'll bless whatever you put your hands to. But I'm going to share with you guys some spiritual principles that, that if you will put into practice, what will be a tremendous blessing for you, for your kids, for your grandkids. And, and the first thing I want to talk about is about tithing. Now, in the last 10 years, I would say, I have seen a huge attack on tithing and all over social media, books written, articles written. And I'm going to share this with you. You can be saved and tithe, and you can be saved and not tithe. Tithing is not salvation, all right? Um, salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Salvation comes through what Jesus did when he died on that cross. When he came to this earth, he died on that cross, was buried, and three days later resurrected, okay? Um, tithing is a spiritual principle, all right? And I'm going to share with you spiritual principles that if you would apply in your lives, you will see blessings in, in, in your life. And I really believe in spiritual principles, um, uh, I was going to share this later, but I'll share it right now. I, I really believe in spiritual principles. I have a friend named Terry, and, and he, he's, he's, a, he's a little guy. He, he, he's short, and, and um, he's, he's, he's un gringo. He's out in Tennessee. He's a leader of pastors. He's not a pastor, but he's a leader of pastors. And every once in a while, Terry will talk on the phone, and he'll say, say, man. And I'm like, what? And he says, he, he'll ask me this question. Do you still give your parents a glass of water at church? And I'm like, every Sunday, right? There's a, there's a teaching that Jesus says that if you would give a, a, a cup of cold water to one of my servants, you will not lose your reward. I believe in that spiritual principle. My mom is here as a witness. She will tell you every Sunday, and she comes Saturday morning and Saturday nights. Every time she comes to church, I give her a cold. I don't give her a, a bottle of water. I give her a cold bottle because Jesus says a cold cup of water. My dad, same thing. Every time he comes to church, I give it to him. The Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother that your days will be long on the land that I give you. I believe in that spiritual principle. Me and my parents, we're like typical sons and parents. We don't get along, we don't, uh, get along. We don't uh, agree on every little thing, but I honor my parents, right? I honor them publicly, I honor them privately because I believe in spiritual principles. And I'm gonna share with you why I tithe, all right? I'm gonna share with you my journey through scriptures on why I tithe. Now, one of the attacks on tithing, uh, well, first of all, let me, let, me, let me explain what tithing is. It's, it's common, and, and it's more common in this service, that there's a lot of new people to the faith. Like you just came to church, right? You just started coming to church not too long ago. And then the pastor says at the end of service, on the way out, you can give your tithes and offering. And it's common that people will come in and ask me, they're like, pastor, what are tithes? And I always tell them, well, tithes is something you eat with a little bit of tahine, lemon juice, no, I'm, Tabasco. No, I'm just kidding. No. Uh, they ask, like, what are tithes and, and, and how do I give them? So tithe, a tithe means 10%, all right? And, and it's real easy to calculate. Um, if you add $10, you'd have, write it down, it'd be 10.00. If you would move the decimal to the left, that would leave you with 1.00. So, so a dollar from $10, $10 from $100, all right? Um, everybody's cool with those numbers. Now, it gets, it gets sketchy when we say $100 from $1,000. $100? And, and like what? It gets sketchier if we go higher. Like, it's $1,000 from every 10,000. What, what do you mean 1,000 from every 10? You know, it gets sketchier, you know, if we went to like, man, it, that's 100,000 from a million. Now, I'm not giving the church 100,000. That's why you ain't making a million. <laughs> you got all offended there. Okay, I'm just saying. Okay. Okay, so that, that's what a tithe is, is, is to give a, a tenth of, of what we make or what we earn. Um, now, Abraham, Abraham is considered, he is called the father of believers, the father of people of faith, okay? He, here's Abraham, he, imagine Abraham, he's with his family, he's in a foreign land, he, I mean, he's living in, in the land where his family lived. He, owned, he knows the idols. He knows gods that are, that, that are statues and the sun and the moon. And all of a sudden, he hears an a voice from an invisible God, the God. And the invisible God tells Abraham, Abraham, leave your family, leave your people, leave your land, and I'm going to show you where. Now, if that happened to me, I'd be like, I think I'm turning crazy. I'm, I need to go see a doctor, right? Abraham realized, like, this is God speaking to me. 
This is the true God speaking to me. And he takes a step of faith. He leaves his family. He leaves his land. He leaves what he knows to a place he doesn't know. And when he leaves, one of his nephews named Lot, he was a pretty smart guy because he said, man, you know what? I'm, I'm going with my uncle. And so God begins to bless Abraham and begins to bless Lot. All right? Lot is Abraham's nephew. Now, you remember we've been, we've been learning Psalms 23? Um, somebody help me out. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over, right? There's overflow. So God is blessing Abraham so much that Lot begins to be blessed. And they begin to prosper. And they begin to have more cattle and more servants. And Lot's servants begin to fight with Abraham's servants because there's not a lot of room for them. So Abraham's like, look, 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 we're family. Let's keep the peace. Lot, you pick where you want to go. So Lot looked around and he goes, there's green pastures over there. I'm going to go over there. Abraham's like, that's cool. Then God tells Abraham, okay, Abraham, I'm going to bless you special. You see everything you see? That's yours and your descendants. So where Lot ends up, the nephew ends up, he ends up over there. Maybe you've heard of this little place called Sodom and Gomorrah, right? He ends up in that place. And one day these kings arise and attack and they take slaves. They take cattle. They take riches. Amongst the slaves, they, they attacked Lot, and they took him and his family, and they take him away, and someone comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, at this time his name is Abram. They're like, Abram, have you heard what happened to your nephew Lot? And he's like, no, what happened? And they're like, they, they got attacked, and they took him away, and they took away slaves, and they took away cattle, and they took away golds and riches and all this stuff, and amongst them was your nephew. They took him as a slave. So Abram raises up an army from his servants, and he goes and he attacks the king that attacked his nephew, and he rescues the people, All right? Well, that's a lot of work, a lot of men, a lot of, a lot of sacrifice. So he brought some riches back with him. This is where we're at in Genesis chapter 14. Now, this is, this is one of the attacks on giving your tithes is people tell you, well, we live in the New Testament, which is under grace, and tithing is the Old Testament, which is the law, all right? Okay, the law was given to us by Moses, all right? Abraham lived 400 years before Moses, all right? So what we're going to look at right now with Abraham is 400 years before Moses is even born, they're, they're still not in Egypt. The law happened after they escaped Egypt, and they were in Egypt for 400 years. So this is before all of that, okay? Genesis chapter 14, verse 17. After Abram returned from his victory over, I, mean, I have no idea how to pronounce this name, Kedor Laomer and all his allies, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh. That is the king's valley, right? Because Sodom is where Lot lived. Verse 19. Melchizedek, and I'm sorry, verse 18. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and a priest of God most high, brought Abram some bread and wine. Now, okay, real quick. We're learning a lot about the Bible today. The priest in the Old Testament, the priest that served in the, taber in the tabernacle, and then they later served in the temple, they came from one of the 12 tribes of Israel, all right? Anybody know which tribe they came from? They came from, the, that's why you come to Pueblo's church. They came from the tribe of Levi, all right? The priest came from the tribe of Levi, all right? Um, Aaron all right, uh, was the first high priest. He came from the tribe of Levi. They, that's why they're called Levitical priests, all right? Or the Levitical law, right? Or in your Bible, it talks about Leviticus, right? It, uh, that's from the tribe of Levi. This tribe doesn't even exist yet because Levi hasn't been born, all right? Levi's father hasn't been born yet. His, Levi's grandfather hasn't been born yet. So this tribe doesn't exist yet. Abram meets another priest, right? Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah, and the tribe of Judah is where all the kings come from, Yet Jesus is not only our king, he is our high priest. How is Jesus our high priest if he didn't come from the tribe of Levi? He's from the tribe of Judah. A, a, a priest cannot come from the tribe of 
Judah, because that's where the kings come from. Well, the reason that Jesus is able to be our high priest is because he doesn't come from the priesthood lineage of Levi. He comes from the priesthood lineage of this guy right here, Melchizedek. Okay. Now, Mel Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and the priest of God Most High brought Abram some bread and wine. Verse 19. Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. So he blesses Abraham. He says, hey, look, Abram, blessed are you by the God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. 20. And blessed be God Most High, who has defeated your enemies for you. So Melchizedek blesses Abraham by saying, look, you're blessed by the Most High. And he goes, and blessed be the Most High who gave you the victory. Okay. Verse 20 then continues and says, no, verse 20. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a what? A tenth of all the goods he had recovered, right? The tenth, that's a tithe. So he gave Melchizedek a tithe. Melchizedek the priest blesses Abram, the father of faith, the father of the believers. Abram in return gives Melchizedek a tenth. Notice that it says of all the goods. I kid you not, Instagram and Facebook and social media is listening to us. I kid you not, last night I saw a reel and, and they're talking about, well, you know, if you really study tides, it's, it's agriculture. Like they gave sheep and they gave um, grain. That's not what I read about Abraham. Abraham gave a tenth of sheep, of grain. He gave a tenth of what? All. And what does all mean? All means all. That's all that all means. All means everything. Rather it was grain, rather it was sheep, rather it was gold, silver, precious stones, slaves, servants, whatever it was, Abram gave Melchizedek, he said, here, aquí están mis diezmos, right? He said, here's my tithe, here's my tenth. Okay. 400 years before the law, all right? 400 years before the law. Okay. Now, Abram, later his name is changed to Abraham. Abraham has a son of promise. All right, the son of promise, his name is Isaac. All right, the son of promise is Isaac. He's the one that Abram almost sacrificed. All right, Isaac. Isaac has twins. All right, God chooses the younger twin named Jacob. Jacob means a supplanter, all right, or trickster. Later, God changes Jacob's name to Israel, and Israel means prince. Okay, Jacob has twelve sons. All right. Amongst those 12 sons is Judah. That's where we get the tribe of Judah. That's where the kings come from, right? Uh, Levi, that's where we get the Levitical priest from. Right? Joseph, we'll talk about him in a little bit. Joseph and the story of Joseph and Pharaoh. Those are the sons of Jacob. That's where we get the 12 tribes of Israel. And it took, it took generations to build up these families, right? So now we're going to read about Jacob. Jacob is still about 400 years before the law. All right, about 400 years before the law. Genesis 28, verse 20. Right? This is in your Bible. I didn't go last night and put this in your Bible. My dad used to say that when I was a kid. I used to always get a kick out of that. Then Jacob made this vow. If God will indeed be with me and protect me on this journey, and he, if he will provide me with food and clothing, 21, and if I return safely to my father's home, then the Lord will certainly be my God. He's like, okay, I'm going to put my faith in God is what he's saying. Verse 22. And this memorial pillar I have set up will become a place of worshiping God, for worshiping God. And I will present to God, what will he present to God? A tenth of what? Everything he gives me. Not a tenth of the cattle. Not a tenth of the grain. A tenth of everything he gives me. Right? Again, this is about 400 years before Moses gives the law, the Levitical law, where it talks about, you know, the nation giving their tithes and et cetera. So I'm bringing this up because we see that there's a spiritual principle, right? There's a spiritual principle. Again, uh, if you don't give your tithe, I don't believe that, oh, you're going to lose your salvation. You don't give your tithe. No, no, no. But I, but I want us to understand that, hey, Abraham gave his tithe of everything. And Jacob gave his tithe of everything? There's something there. Okay, now let's go to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 23. 
Oftentimes people say, well, you know, the tithe, that's Old Testament. We live in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus, when he walked on this earth, there are certain things he didn't teach on because it's a given, right? <laughs> certain things he didn't have to teach on because it's already a given, right? But Jesus constantly butted heads with the religious people of his day. He butted heads more with the religious people of his day than he did with sinners. I'm going to tell you, as a pastor, I butt heads more with the religious people here at church than I do with the sinners. Luckily, here at Polo's Church, there's no religious people. They, they all came at, no, I'm, just, I'm not going to tell you what service they came <laughs> But let's just say it was pretty early in the morning. <laughs> Anyways, I'm kidding. It's all a joke. All right. So here's Jesus. So the religious people in Jesus' days, it was three groups. Pharisees, Sadducees, and the scribes, right? The, what's the difference between Pharisees and Sadducees? I'm gonna, you'll never forget this, okay? The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. Right? Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Therefore, they were sad, you see? All right? <laughs> You'll never, you'll never forget it. And for now on, Pharisees and Sadducees, what's the difference? Pharisees believed in the resurrection. This, this is a true, what I'm telling you, it's very true. Okay, so Matthew 23, verse 23. Jesus speaking. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, the scribes, and you Pharisees? What does he call them? Hypocrites. <gasps> Jesus said, oh, I thought Jesus was all about love and peace and thou and thee and blesseth. He tells them, hypocrites, exclamation point. You hypocrites. I'm glad nobody's saying amen when I say you hypocrites. Okay. For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. All right. Let's, let's pause right there. Some Bibles talk about the mint, like you tithe the mint. Anybody Bible say that? Anybody? Okay, what, what does it say? Um, uh, Yeah, yeah, so it, it talks about several herbs, little herbs. And it's like, oh, you, you, Jesus says, you hypocrites, you tie these little herbs. I was thinking about that. I'm like, what's the application for us today? Who here goes to La Taqueria? Anybody go to La Taqueria? You are such liars. <laughs> Everybody here eats at Taquerias. Did y'all not understand the question? Parlez-vous français or something? Let me ask again. ¿Cuántos aquí comen en La Taqueria? How many here eat in Taqueria? Oh, okay, I understood in Spanish. Okay. <laughs> Puro fogo de chao. <laughs> Put a cafes for y'all. Calm down. <laughs> okay. Of all of you who go to the taqueria, how many, how many again? How many go to the taqueria? Come on, let's be honest. All of you, okay. Of all of you that go to the taqueria, thank you. Of all of you that go to the taqueria, how many of you pray after you eat about two, three baskets of chips and then you pray for the tacos? You didn't pray before the chips, but you prayed after. Let's be honest. All right. Okay, I was thinking about this. This is sort of like that. Like Jesus is like, you hypocrites, you do the tiniest thing. Like you don't even pray for the chips, right? That's, that's pretty much what Jesus is saying. Like, I'm going to give you an example. My wife and I, when we got for married, promised, she's here as a witness. One of our first conversations as a married couple, serious conversations as a married couple, and this is early. I mean, this is like the, I think like the day after our wedding, she says, hey, babe, you're going to have to increase your tithes because now we're two-income family, right? You know what my response was? My response was, I already did. That's how important tithing is to me and my family, right? I already did. And, um, but I will tell you something. I'm a big tither. I believe in tithing. I come from five generations of tithers, from my great-great-grandfather parents, to my great-grandparents, to my grandparents and my mom's my uncles, to my parents, to us, I mean, my siblings, we all tithe, uh, uh, my nephews and nieces tithe, we teach our, our daughters to give. But I will tell you something where I don't tithe. Not on purpose, it's just one of those things. Sometimes, you know, I'm walking and I find a dollar on the floor, and I'll get that dollar and I'll put it in my pocket, and you know what? I won't give 10 cents. Anybody here ever done that? Of those who tithe, right? What Jesus is saying, like, man, you tithe on even the tiniest income. That dollar that you find, you make sure that you give 10 cents. Those chips, you make sure you pray. But then he says, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. What is Jesus saying is that justice, mercy, and faith is more important than you tithing. Right? And, and I agree 100%. I'm, that's why I'm sharing this verse with you. Right? There are things more important than tithing. Okay, But notice what Jesus says next. He says, you should tithe. 
Yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Don't neglect justice, mercy, and faith. Jesus doesn't say, don't tithe. You guys are doing totally wrong. I mean, the mint, come on. What am I going to do with a tenth of a mint? Right? No, he doesn't say that. He says, and you should do it. But don't forget justice, mercy, and faith. So next time someone says, like, oh, well, you know, and then they're going to make the argument, well, he was talking to the Jews and not to us. Like, okay, some people, they, no más no les va a entrar. Right? It's part of life. Okay, I want you to go to Hebrews 7. And... Um, from Hebrews 7, we're going to go to Malachi 3, and Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. So Hebrews is, is, is closer to, to the end, um, and then we're going to go to Malachi, which is right before Matthew, um, last book of the Old Testament. He Hebrews 3. Okay. Now again, I, I, I'm emphasizing, I'm making the teaching on tithing as a principle, but I'm showing my personal journey as I'm studying the scriptures, right, why I tithe. Now, in Hebrews 7, if you're, you're new, how many have less than a year coming to church? Anybody have less than a year coming to church? Okay. Wow. How many have, like, less than a year, like, going to any church? Like, this is your first church. Like, you know, anybody? A few people? Okay. Let me tell you. If you came and you asked me, Pastor, I want to read the Bible. Where should I start? I will tell you, start with the New Testament. Start with Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Read the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Read them a couple of times. Read the New Testament, Matthew to Revelations, and then read Psalms and Proverbs. And do that a couple of times. Do that two, three times. Then go ahead and read the whole Bible, right? Go ahead and read the whole Bible. But when you reach Hebrews, after reading the whole Bible, Hebrews connects what you're seeing in the Old Testament with what Jesus did. So it connects all the priests of the Old Testament with our high priest, which is Jesus. Connects the men and heroes of faith with the ultimate hero of faith, our Savior Jesus. Connects all the sacrifices, lambs and doves and goats that were sacrificed, connects it with the ultimate sacrifice, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. Hebrews does that connection for us. And Hebrews shares several heroes of the faith and things that they did. Okay. So Hebrews 7 touches on what we first started with Abram in Genesis. Hebrews 7 verse 4 says, Consider then how great this Melchizedek was. Even Abraham, the great patriarch of Israel, recognized this by giving him, give, what did he give him? A tenth of what he had taken in battle. So Abraham recognizes the greatness of Melchizedek. Right? And how does he honor him? Give him a tithe. Right? Verse 5. Now the law of Moses, now this is 400 years later, the law of Moses required that the priests who are descendants of Levi must collect the tithe from the rest of the people of Israel who are also descendants of Abram. So the law required that, hey, the nation of Israel, you're going to pay your tithes to the priests, right? To the uh, descendants of Levi, to the tribe of Levi, the Levitical priests. Verse 6 says, but Melchizedek was not a descendant of Levi. He, he was a priest of the Most High collected a tenth from Abraham. And Melchizedek placed a blessing upon Abraham, the one who had already received the promises of God. So what is the author of Hebrews saying? He's like, look, when Melchizedek came before Abraham, Abraham blessed him with the tenth, blessed him with the tithe. Melchizedek is in a high, he wasn't part of the Levitical priests. He wasn't part of the tribe of Levi. But Abraham recognized, hey, this is a priest of the Most High. Verse 7 says, and without question, the person who has power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. What he's saying is that, hey, this Melchizedek guy, he was greater than Abraham. And Abraham is the great patriarch. We are here today because of Abraham. We serve and worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We are here because of, of a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Judah, Jesus. Verse 8 says, the priests who collect tithes are men who die. So Melchizedek is greater than they are because we are told that he lives on. So Melchizedek doesn't represent a man. He lives on. Men die. The priests from Levi, they die. This Melchizedek, he lives on. He didn't have an ending. Verse 9 says, in addition... We might even say that these Levites, the ones who collect the tithe, paid a tithe to Melchizedek, 
when their ancestor Abraham paid a tithe to him. Verse 10, for although Levi wasn't born yet, the seed from which he came was in Abraham's body, Abraham's body when Melchizedek collected the tithe from him. So what is he saying? He's saying that when Abraham gave the tithe, it had a generational impact. It had generational impact to where the Levites, who later would receive the tithe, they themselves had tithe to Melchizedek because they were that seed that was still in Abraham. I'm going I'm I'm to share with you, I mentioned earlier that I come from a family with me, five generations of tithers, with, with my nephews and nieces and my kids, six generations of tithers. I remember at my great-grandfather's funeral, his pastor spoke in Victoria, Texas, and his pastor said that when my great-grandfather moved to Victoria, they had lived there, they had moved, they had come back, but he says that when he came, he went and introduced himself to the pastor, and he told the pastor, Pastor, you, this is going to be our church, you're going to be our pastor, I'm going to bring you my tithes. And he says that all of a sudden, my great-grandfather would show up with an egg because the chickens gave 10 eggs. And all of a sudden, he says that my great-grandfather would show up with a, a costal de frijoles, a bag of, of beans, because, you know, I guess that's what they planted or something, and, and he'd separate the tent, and he would, he would take it. And, and, and I believe that many of the blessings that, 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 I, uh, that I see in, in the ministry, that I see in my personal life, is because the seed. Right? When my great-great-grandfather would give his tithe, I was given my tithe. When my great-grandfather was given his tithe, I was given my tithe, right? When uh, my grandmother and my uncles and aunts were given their tithe, I was given my tithe. When my parents first came to the faith, they would give their tithes, right? I was given my tithe. And I believe my, my kids will be blessed because they come from that same, see, this is generational impact. And what I'm gonna share with you today will impact generations, right? Will impact generations. Okay, now let's go to Malachi, chapter 3. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Between, here's a pop test, pop, pop quiz, pop quiz. Between Abraham and the law, how many years were there? 400, okay. Between Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, and the announcement of Jesus, the heavens open and they announce the birth of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, there's, there's 400 years as well, all right? There's 400 years. So the, the heavens are going to be silenced for 400 years. So I would say whatever God tells his people to do is going to be pretty important if he's about to shut the heavens down for 400 years. And what God tells his people, he says, look, let's make a pact. You do this, I'll bless you. You don't do this, my blessing will not be over you. That's what Malachi is all about. I, I recommend for you later to make time to go read Malachi. Okay, it's the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, just the very first part of verse 6. It says, I am the Lord and I do not change. One more time. I am the Lord and I do not change. Now, we're not going to go to another book. We're not going to go to another chapter. We are simply going to move two verses forward. I am the Lord, I do not change. Verse 8. Should people cheat God? Some of your Bibles say, can man rob God? Yet you have cheated me. He says, yet you've robbed me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? Some of your Bibles say, what do you mean? When did we ever rob you? And he says, you have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. Okay. I, like my dad used to say, I didn't go last night and put this in your Bible. Okay. Verse 9. You are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me, verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, oh, okay, God is about to, to make a challenge here. He's about to tell you, if you will do this, this is what I'm gonna do. Says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it, put me to the test. God is talking to you. He's telling you, try me, put me to the test. I, I read this. I, I take, I, I mean, you know what? I'm going to take God up on it. Right? Verse 11 says, Your crops will be abundant. 
for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Verse 12. Then all nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Right? Why, why do I give my tithes? Me, Ruben Villarreal, Pastor Ruben Villarreal. I give my tithes because a couple of things. One, I see it as a spiritual exercise. Right? I see it as a spiritual exercise. It keeps me as a spiritual person. Right? It puts in check my greed. If I'm giving my tithe, it puts in check my greed. Right? If I'm giving my tithes, it puts in check my envy, my jealousy. If I give my tithes, it's, it's, a, it's a step of faith. Because what is it that I'm saying? Every time I give my tithes, every time my wife and I, we give our tithes, what we're saying to ourselves is we're saying we believe that we can do more with 90% of what we earn and God's promise in Malachi than what we could do with 100% without that promise. Okay. Why, why do I give my tithes? Because as we just saw, when I look at great men of faith, men like Abraham, men like Jacob, and then men that I know today that I respect. When I look at my great-grandparents who took a leap of faith and put their faith in Jesus Christ, leaving old ways, leaving old religions, leaving old beliefs. When I see my great-grandparents, when I see my, my mom's uncles and aunts and her mother, when I see my grandma, when I see uh, my parents, I see people of great faith give their tithes. Well, man, I'm like, there's something there. There, there's, there's something there, and I'm going to tap in to this spiritual principle the same way I honor my parents because I'm tapping in to that promise that is the first commandment with promise, and the same way I tap in to a spiritual principle when I give my parents a cold water every time they come to church because Jesus says that when you give one of my servants a cold cup of water, you will not lose your reward. Why do I give my tithes? Because I've read Genesis to Revelations multiple times. And in all the Bible, there is only one way to open up the windows of heaven. And it's what we just read right now. It is the only way. Right? Now, I'm going to say this as we move out of this subject, because it's a three for one, and this was the longer one. As we move out of the subject of tithes, I'm going to say this. If you cannot give your tithe with joy, with gladness, and with faith, as your pastor, my biggest recommendation for you is don't give your tithe. Right? G give whatever you want to give, but don't, 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 don't give your tithe. If you cannot do it with joy, with gladness, and with faith, don't do it. If you can do it with joy, gladness, and faith, my biggest recommendation to you is do it. Right? Do it. And you will see six months from now, one year from now, you will say, like, you know what? We eat. Our bills get paid. We see the Lord's hand over our home. Right? Again, the most important thing of today's teaching is that salvation is in Jesus Christ and in the work he did, not in our tithes, not in our offerings, right? Not in being a member of Pueblo's church, but in what Jesus did. I'm sharing with you because I want you to prosper, right? And so I'm, I have two more things I need to share with you, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a formula with you that's gonna, that will change the direction of your family for generations if you will follow this. Okay, okay, so that was about tithing. The second thing I want to touch on today is about savings and investing. If you don't have these pictures, if you don't have these verses, go ahead and take a picture of these verses. Um, but let's read uh, Proverbs 13, verse 11. It says, Wealth from get-rich-quick schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. Beware of all these get, this is a tongue twi twister, especially after speaking Spanish, three service, two services and drinking cold water. Beware of get rich quick schemes. They're all over the internet, all over social media, all over, buy, buy this, uh, you know, flipping houses. And this, this. I'm not saying that you can't make money doing those things, but beware that some of those are a scheme. You know, take this course for, you know, $199, you know, whatever. Like, like there's a lot of schemes out there. It, it's better for you to work hard and grow over time than to try and get rich quick. I'll tell you in my own personal life, and this is a confession, a public confession I'll make. The times I've gotten in trouble is when I'm trying to do things quick, not dotting I's and not crossing T's, all right? Wealth from hard work grows over time. And we all should be hard workers. 
anytime a Christian is hired, that Christian should outperform everyone who is not a Christian. Okay? We should give test, good testimony at work. At work, they, they should be like, man, anyone else at your church need a job? <laughs> that should be a common thing here at Pueblo's Church, that at your job, people ask you that. Anyone else at your church need a job? Not, oh man, those Christians, ugh. Oh, those people from Pueblo's Church, ugh. Like, man, I rebuke that in Jesus' name, right? Like, we, we should be the hardest workers because we're working not for men, we work to honor God, right? You, you sweeping, you need a sweep, like Jesus is going to pass by there. You flipping burgers, well, you better make that cheeseburger like you go, you're about to serve it to Jesus himself, all right? You're an engineer and architect, you, you design, don't, don't skip anything, don't skimp on anything. The best, like, if, hey, this building is where Jesus is going to be hanging out, or this is a house where, you, where Jesus is going to stay, all right? That, that should be our attitude when it comes to things, okay? The other thing I will share with you is um, Luke chapter um, 19, and, and Luke chapter 19, verse 12 says, a noble man was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. Before he left, he called together 10 of his servants and divided among them 10 pounds of silver, saying, invest this for me while I'm gone. So this man, he's going to leave. He's, they're going to go crown him king. He's about to come back. But he gets 10 of his servants and he says, look, I'm not going to be here, so you got to do what I got to do. You have to do what I would do if I were here. Here's money, here's money, here's money, here's money, here's money. Go invest it, make money. Use the money to make money. This is key. This is important. With today's social media, with YouTube, with books, with libraries, with Google, with chat, GBT, living in the United States of America, everybody here should be figuring out how over time can I turn my $1 into $2? How can I invest my, my $1 and over time turn that $1 into $2 and those $2 into $4? That's called compound interest. I'll tell you right now, I cannot give you any personal financial advice because if I told you, man, invest in the stock market and I was to tell you what to buy and the way the stock market goes up and down, if it had a little dip, some of y'all want to sue me. But there's YouTube, there's Google, there's ChatGPT, there's books, there's courses, there's colleges, there's universities. There's no reason in today's age to not learn about investing. All right, another verse I want to share with you is we're going to go back to Genesis 41, right? And in Genesis 41, we had Abraham, gave a tenth. His grandson, Jacob, promises, everything I get, I'm going to give you a tenth. I'm going to give you a tithe. Jacob has 12 sons. One of his favorite sons was named Joseph. So the brothers hated on Joseph. They sell Joseph as a slave, and he ends up in Egypt. In Egypt, he ends up in prison. And... Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, has a dream, and he needs someone to interpret the dream, and someone says, you know, there's one of those Hebrew boys in the jail, and he knows how to interpret dreams. So they bring Joseph before Pharaoh, and I want you to look at the advice that Joseph gives Pharaoh. Let's read Genesis 41, verse 34. Then Pharaoh should appoint supervisors over the land and let them collect one-fifth of all the crops during the Seven good years. There are going to be seven good years and then seven bad years. Seven years of abundance and then seven years of, of, um, of scarcity. And, and Joseph tells Pharaoh, hey, you need to get governors. You need smart people all around you. And what you need to do is have them collect one-fifth of all the crops in the seven good years. One-fifth is 20%. Right? One-fifth is 20%. All right? So he says, get 20% and put it aside. Okay? Save 20%. Verse 35. Have them gather all the food produced in the good years that are just ahead and bring it to Pharaoh's storehouses. Store it away and guard it so there will be food in the cities. That way, there will be enough to eat when the seven years of famine come to the land of Egypt. Otherwise, this famine will destroy the land. Let me tell you what happened to Egypt. They began, Pharaoh says, you know what? You're a smart guy. You be the one in charge. Joseph said, okay, now Joseph knows something about money. How do we know that Joseph knows something about money? Because his, his grandfather was given a tithe to Melchizedek. His father had promised the Lord a tithe. Right? Today, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are amongst the richest people in the entire world. Right? 
You look at Forbes' list of 100. The Jewish people are one of the smallest worldwide populations, yet they occupy more positions in Forbes' richest people of the world. Okay? So I think they know a little bit about money. So Joseph's like, hey, get a, get, get a fifth, get 20% and save it. You know what happened? People started coming like, hey, we need food. They sold it. They made money. And then you know what happened? People came back and said, we need more food. We don't have money. We'll give you our cattle. Egypt, Pharaoh took the cattle. You know what happened after that? They ran out of food. They came back and said, we've given you money. We've given you our cattle. Now we'll give you our land if you'll sell us food. Pharaoh took it. When the food ran out, they came back and they said, we've given you all of our money. We've given you all of our cattle. We've given you all of our land. Now take us as your slaves, as your servants, and we'll work the land for you. Egypt became the richest, most powerful country in its day. How? Because Pharaoh followed the advice of a young man named Joseph, a descendant of Abraham, a son of Jacob, who they had learned before to give their tent. Like, hey, you know what? Save and work the 20%. A fifth, right? Save and work to 20%. A fifth, okay. All right, let's move on to the third one. All right, I'm going to keep you a little bit later than normal today. I'll make it up to you next week. I'll let you out one minute early next week, okay? Right. Okay, the last thing, spending. All right, this is the third category. I tell you it's a three for one today, spending. Some of you have a spending problem. Uh, nobody said amen. <laughs> Some of y'all have a lying problem. <laughs> Proverbs 22, verse 7. Just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. Ring, hello, es el primo. What's up, cuz? Oh, man, I don't have enough to um, pay rent. You think you can help me out? How much you need? 500. 500? Yeah, but don't worry, man. Once I get my income tax, I'm going to pay you right back. Pastor's about to give you advice because I want to restore your family. If you don't have the money to give El Primo $500 and let him have it, I know he's telling you he's going to pay you back, but if, if you don't have the money to say, here's $500, pay me, hallelujah. Don't pay me, hallelujah. It doesn't matter to me. I want to help you. If you don't have that money, don't loan him money. Don't loan him money. If you're okay with giving him $500 and he pays you, hallelujah, and he doesn't pay you, hallelujah, then go ahead and give it to him. Right? Why? Because notice that all of a sudden the relationship changed from cuz, from primos, to servant and master. Right? You loaned him $500, you changed that relationship. You're now a master and you're a servant. You know what's going to happen? He's going to get his income tax. And he's going to pay his bills. And he's going to take his family out on vacation and he's going to post it on social media right? and July is going to come around and your wife is going to be like you know I was thinking that maybe we ought to take the kids to like a cruise in Cancun and you're like man that costs money and you're like well you know what? I'm just going to call El Primo because I sure could use those $500 and you call your cousin and you're like, hey, primo, do you remember when I loaned you those $500 and you said as soon as you got the income tax, you would pay me? Man, uh, things are kind of tight right now at the house. And, you know, my wife, she wants to go see her mom. You didn't say that she wants to see her mom in Cancun, right? But, you know, my wife wants to go see her mom. And um, you think you can pay me back? And you know what the primo tells you? Man, I knew you only call me. You only call me anytime it has to do with money. That's why you call me. Man, you know what? Just for that, I'm not going to pay you. It hangs up on you. Ya se hizo el enojado, right? Now he's acting like he's mad, so he doesn't have to pay you, and you're just like, right? If you, if, if you can't just let him have it, don't loan it to him, right? Whatever you feel comfortable giving him and him not paying you back or she's not paying you back, loan him that, right? Loan him that. It's better to keep the peace, right? It's better to keep the peace. The moment you loan, you, you become a... a a master to them. The moment you borrow, you borrow from Visa, you borrow from Best Buy, you borrow from Toyota, you borrow from Chase, guess what? According to Scripture, what have you become? You become a servant. Notice what's the other credit card? Not Visa, but what's the other credit card? Master card. You servant, they're the master. Okay. All right, let's go on to another verse. 
Romans chapter 13, verse 8. In Romans 13, verse 8 says, Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. Scripture is telling us, like, we should not get into debt. We should not get into debt. Owe nothing to anyone. If you owe money to someone, you have the obligation as a Christian to do everything possible to pay them back. Right? Jesus paid our debt. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus paid our debt. And as followers of Jesus, we should always pay our debts. Right? So you have a debt you owe, whether it's to Visa or it's to El Primo. or whoever. You, you should go out of your way to pay off that debt. You, you got student loans? Right? No one forced you to do that. Be responsible and pay that debt back. Well, the government's offering, you know, I don't know about all that. You took out a loan knowing the obligations, knowing the terms. Right? We need to pay our, our debts back. It's biblical, all right? It's biblical that we need to pay our debts back. Okay, okay last verse I want to share with you. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to verse 8. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. 7. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Right? We need to learn, we need to learn to practice gratitude and satisfaction with what we have while also striving for improvement. Right? Practice gratitude and um, uh, uh, being content with what we have. At the same time, strive for improvement. Right? Go get that certification. Go get that degree. Right? Um, go get the education. Go buy that lawnmower so on the weekends you can, you know, cut your neighbor's yards or, or, or what have you. Right? But at the same time, be content with what we have. Right? Like be, be, be content with what you have. Okay? So these are, these are three principles that I share. Now, now I'm going to tie, tie it all together for you. Okay? I'm going to share with you a formula that if you would apply this formula in your life, you're going to change the direction of, of generations, all right? We had a lot of 20-year-olds, teens and 20-year-olds raise their hands, all right? The, the, believe me, I, I was sharing this last service um, that my great-grandparents both passed away. My great-grandfather and my great-grandmother both passed away at 98, 98 years old. I'm, I'm 48 I don't know if I want to live to be 98 years old. But let's say, vamos a decir, that the Lord gives me 40 years of, of life and health. And last service, um, I wish my wife a happy birthday. And I was like, may the Lord bless you with many more good years and in good health because I need someone to take care of me when I'm old, right? <laughs> but um, I, I'm just kidding. I have four daughters. I'm not worried. Uh, <laughs> um, but let's say that the good Lord blesses me with, with 40 more years. If you would teach, those of you that are in your 20s, if you would put into practice what I'm going to share with you today, because our people, we don't, we don't know these things, all right? I'm sharing with you gold. You that are in your 20s, if you will put into practice what I'm going to share with you right now, this formula, 40 years from now, you'll be retiring. I'll be getting ready to kick the bucket. You're going to come and you're going to give me a hug and a kiss and you're going to say, Pastor, thank you for what you taught me 40 years ago. All right, I promise you this. All right, I promise you this. Okay, the formula is 10, 10, 80. Everybody say this. Say 10, 10, 80. Again, 10, 10, 80. One more time. 10, 10, 80. First 10 is give your tithe, right? Give your tithe. Open up the windows of heaven. Put your faith into practice, right? Learn to give your tithe. Don't, don't go at it alone. You need God, all right? Give, give your tithe, okay? The second step I would ask you to do is save three to six months of expenses in an emergency fund, right? Calculate how much is rent or how much is my house note, how much is my car note, how much is gas, how much is the light bill, how much is water, how much is food, okay? Get that, just the bare necessities, the bare basics. Figure out how much you spend on the bare necessities, the bare basics in one month. Multiply that by three to six, by three or six, so let's say six months, three months, six months. Then learn to give your tithes and then let this be your focus that, hey, I'm trying to save money 
for an emergency, and that emergency money, you're gonna put it in a totally different bank, you're gonna cut up the debit card, it's gonna be hard to get to. The only way you can get that emergency money is you need to go in person to withdraw it, all right? So you bank at Chase, go to Shell Credit Union, and you know, uh, my niece, no, I'm just kidding, and uh, you know, go to, go to Wells Fargo or whatever, and open it in a, cut up the debit card where you have to go in person. An emergency fund, shoe sell at Dillard's is not an emergency. The primo's offering you the rims for your truck. That's not an emergency, right? That's not an emergency. An emergency is you broke your ankle and you can't work now for a month or two. Right? That's an emergency. Your transmission broke down. That's an emergency. Kids got hurt. You have to go to urgent care. That's an emergency, right? So, you, so learn to give your tithes. Then you, three, six months saved, put it over there, okay? Second 10. The second 10 is invest, right? Invest 10, okay. I'm not gonna give you financial advice, but I will recommend for you to Google Roth IRA, all right? Learn what a Roth IRA is, all right? Every, all the young people here should have a Roth IRA, all right? And then learn to invest in that Roth IRA, all right? 10% tied, 10% invest, all right? If possible, go Joseph's route, 20% invested. Right? 20% invested. Look, 10% tides, 10%. Now, if you're in your 20s, you're a teen, you're in your 20s, first jobs, all right? You, you just need a little spoon, 10%. You just need a little spoon. If you're getting started in your 30s, man, you don't need a spoon, Bubba. You need a shovel. You need, you need to get up to 20%. Right? If you're starting in your 40s, you don't need a spoon, you don't need a shovel. You, you, need, a, you need a backhoe. You got you have to be doing like 30 or 40%, all right? Now, the last part, 80, 10, 10, 80, 80, 80% 80 that's left live within your means. Some of you 70% if you're investing 20%, right? But that's what's left, live within your means, okay? What does that mean? Don't go into debt, all right? Don't go into debt. Some of you, that means instead of that Lexus, get a Toyota, right? Instead of a Rolex, you get the Timex, okay? Live within that means. Right? For some of you, that means that, hey, while, you're, while your friends are out there hanging out at the lounge and eating in the cafes, you know, you're, you're at home eating tortillas con frijoles y arroz. It was good enough for your grandparents. It's good enough for you. All right? Live within your means. If you're like, whoa, you know, I want, well, you know what? Go get a certification. Go get a better job. If you don't think you earn enough, there's, there's other, you live in America. What, what do you think all these immigrants are coming here for? For the same reason that many of your parents or grandparents came, right? So there's opportunity here. There's opportunity here. Now, I'm gonna finish with this, all right? Remember, 10, 10, 8, take a picture of that. Live by it, I promise you, 20 years from now, you put that into practice, you, you'll come and you'll tell me, Pastor, thank you. Nobody taught me this, thank you. Let me tell you, I have, I have, I have two master's degrees. I believe in education. But the university is not for everybody, right? The university is not for everybody, okay? You go to U of H, $75,000 in loans to get a teaching degree, and then they're gonna start you off at, I don't know what they're starting off right now. I have a lot of teachers here, 60? All right, you got 75,000 in loan for a job that's gonna start you off at 60? That, that doesn't make good math to me. And then you got married and he has 75,000 in loans as well. Now you got 150,000 in loans. And everybody's like, man, you're both college educated. Y'all need a nice car. Uh, and, you know, you're, and now you're, you're driving you know, Lexus or BMWs and everybody's like, man, with that, how are you living in an apartment with those cars and y'all both educated? Y'all need a nice house. All of a sudden you're living in a five bedroom house when it's just you and your, you and your spouse. And all of a sudden, man, you're like half a million dollars in loans, 600,000, 700,000 dollars in loan with a job that's paying you 60,000 a year. That's, that's not good math. That's not good math. You know, there's a little college here in Pasadena called San Jacinto Junior College. You can go to that college and maybe spend about $7,000 and become a welder or a plumber <laughs> or a barber. I have a friend who's a barber who makes well over 100000 a year. That's good math. 7000 and then you're making 100000 That's good math, all right? But going into debt... 75, 80,000 for a job that's gonna pay you 50, 55, 60, that's not good math, right? Now you're going to university for free, praise the Lord, God bless you, 
happy for you, proud of you, all right? But the university is not for everybody. Do good math. Do good math, all right? Do good math, okay? Promise me this will change your, your des the destiny of your children and your grandchildren. Let me pray a blessing over you. Father, I put Pueblo's Church in your hands. I ask that you would bless and prosper every family that is here, that you would help us to apply these spiritual principles in our lives, Lord, to learn to give our tithes, to learn to save and invest, and then to learn to live out of debt within our means. Father, help your people to be creative and figure out ways to invest, figure out ways to live within their means. Be honored and glorified with how we deal with our finances. Father, if there's anyone here that still does not know you through your son Jesus, I ask, Father, that you would open their eyes, that they would see that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to you unless it is through him. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord some praise this afternoon. Hello, I'm Pastor Ruben, and this is my wife, Nayeli Villarreal. We want to thank you for joining us online, and we hope you were blessed by the worship and the teaching of the Word of God. Also, we want you to know that we would love to meet you in person. Join us Sundays at 12 p.m. live here at Pueblos Church. We would love to connect with you. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram to stay up to date with church events. You will also receive encouragement for your life. And if you haven't done so yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel. There, you will be able to watch our service live as well as watch previous preachings from Pastor Ruben. Will you do us a favor? Comment where you're watching us from. We hope you have a blessed week and God willing, we'll see you soon.